today. Today is one of two of the debates that we will have prior to our elections in March. I am Hector Gomez. I am your town manager. And this event is being recorded. It will be broadcasted as well as we will have it on our website for anyone who wishes to see and is not in attendance today. So with that said, I want to speak a little bit about, about our sponsor, and I want to speak a little bit about our special guests. Now I'll hand it off to our special guests to get the show started for us. So again, I'm Hector Gomez, and this event is sponsored by the League of Women's Voter. They're our official sponsors of tonight's event. I want to thank them for being a continued sponsor as well as partner of the town and assisting us as we embark in this big democratic process that we're about to start, which is our elections. A um, little bit about the organization. They have been in existence over 100 years. They're a nonpartisan organization, and they're a not-for-profit organization. So we want to really thank you very much for helping us host and host this event for us tonight. I'll speak a little bit of Judy Lehman. She is currently the League of Women's Voters of Miami-Dade County's Voter Services Chair. I'll hand it off to her shortly. But prior to that, I want to introduce our moderator as well. Our moderator tonight's forum is Dr. Terry Murphy, a public uh, policy professional who has served as a legislative advisor to a number of Miami-Dade County elected officials. Dr. Murphy is now grateful to be working with the Office of the Inspector General in Miami-Dade County. He is also delighted to serve as an adjunct professor with the University of Miami Political Science Department. So I want to thank personally Dr. Murphy for being here tonight. I also want to reserve some claps for, obviously, Ms. Jody Lehman for being here tonight. She will assist for timekeeping, but I would like to hand it off to her shortly for a few words, and then we'll get started. Thank you very much. Great turnout, Town of Surfside. Really awesome governance commitment. Um, just want to go quickly over the rules uh, for the candidate forum. Um, there's an agreement by the candidates that no portion of, the, of, of this uh, candidate forum will be used for political advertisement. Um, phones and other electronic communication equipment must be turned off and not used by the candidates. There will be three minutes per candidate for an opening statement, and it will go in alphabetical order, which is easy because there are two of you. Um, I will be the timekeeper, and there were questions that were submitted by people here and not here in advance. People had an opportunity in the town of Surfside to submit questions, and uh, Dr. Murphy, our moderator, has <coughs> those questions and selected the Excuse questions. Me. Of the voters here. After that, there will be two minutes for a response, and I will be waving my charge around to let um, the candidates. Thank you. Well, good evening, everyone. It's a pleasure to be back here in Surfside. Good to see you again. Uh, this has become kind of a, a you know a regular thing for me. Uh, the League of Women Voters has. Uh, been kind enough to invite me again to, to serve as the moderator for debates up here in Surfside, and uh, I really appreciate it. I'm sorry my, my own wife is not here tonight, even though she's a longtime member of the League of Women Voters. She thought I should do this on my own. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's how that goes. But anyway, it's a pleasure to be up here tonight. I've, I've had a chance to read through a number of the, uh, the questions. Uh, we did have a, a volley of questions that came in uh, via email. And we'll try to get through those this evening, and we'll try and be expedient as we go. And, and if Jody will be giving you the signals on timing, I would encourage you not to talk over each other at any point. You'll each individually be recognized you know, to, to make your statements. But for purposes of the audio here, uh, you know, if you're talking over each other or arguing about something, it, it doesn't get picked up correctly on the video. So... If you have comments or reactions to uh, any statements that are made, uh, you'll get your opportunity to respond. But we'll start out with a three-minute session, and I want to be, I'm always deferential to the elected officials and, and, and acknowledge that we have current Mayor Denzinger and former Mayor Burkett. Uh, throughout this evening, of fall, I'll be referring to each as Mr. And we are here tonight as candidates for the Office of Mayor for Surfside. So I'll, I'll respectfully uh, leave the titles out and, and simply go with Mr. Burkett and Mr. Danzinger. 
So we'll start with a, uh, a three-minute statement, and we'll do so alphabetically. So we'll let uh, Mr. Burkett make the opening statements. I'll also add a closing statement before we conclude this evening, and, and we'll reverse the order on that uh, for closing statements at, at the end of the questions. And I think the Q&A period, if we can, well, we'll see how long it takes to you know, run through some of these questions. But I, I imagine we're, you're both available in, for about two hours' time. Sure. You know, I, I think that would probably exhaust the majority of the question content we have here. Uh, so we'll, we'll, you know, we'll give you the closing uh, three, three minutes also at the end. So we'll start now with, with uh, Mr. Burkett. Thank you. Good evening. Are Surfside's best days behind us, as my opponent has said, or will we preserve the amazing lifestyle we currently have while taking smart steps to make sure that quality of life remains even more special? If we follow the giveaway development path of the last two years, coddled billionaires appoint badly conflicted or in one case a former felon to our most important town boards, rewrite our zoning code to permit bigger buildings with more units and traffic, ignore and mistreat residents who come to speak at our meetings, and look the other way while our vice mayor and planning board chairwoman rewrite our laws to simply enrich themselves, our best days are probably behind us. In the two years before my opponent was elected by just 25 votes, I led our town through its worst disasters in its history, COVID and the Champlain collapse. While managing those two huge issues, I also proposed and residents approved several key ballot questions, one which came in very handy recently. As you see, my opponent believes that he should be able to spend your tax money without asking you. He believes that so fervently that he put a question in front of you recently to undo the ballot question I wrote preventing politicians from burying our town in debt. Your no votes recently sent him a powerful message. My opponent constantly flies to Tallahassee and even halfway around the world to hobnob with his pals and kiss up to billionaires. He has been overcome with his own importance, going so far as to kick out our police out of their own gym to reward himself with a large, newly decorated private corner office in town hall. On the contrary, during all my time as your mayor over the last 20 years, I have never spent a dime of our money flying anywhere. That's what we pay lobbyists for. And more importantly, I've never begged developers for any, anything. They've always come to us. It's not the brilliance of our current leaders or their love of big money that made our town the envy and the one-of-a-kind gem that it is. Rather, it is the high-quality decisions and fiscal and zoning discipline that my predecessors and I have undertaken over the last decades that has made Surfside into a unique, world-renowned destination. Running our town is not complicated. Keep it affordable, keep it friendly and efficient, keep it safe, keep the kids entertained, keep our seniors active, stop the speeding, stop the cut-through traffic, encourage world-class compatible development, keep your promises, and keep it beautiful. That's what I did, and that's what I will do. My opponent will tell you I'm a slumlord, a deadbeat dad a predator landlord, and generally a terrible person. Sadly, I'm not surprised that he would say those things just to win. What my opponent will not tell you is that that slum he refers to is a $14 million Miami Beach trophy property that got smashed by Hurricane Irma, needed massive repairs, but is back better than ever. Or that I've always been a loving and supportive dad. Or that pointing out an eviction or a business dispute in court over a 40-year period is just silly, but then again, it's not about the truth for my opponent and his money donors. It's only about winning. Here's your choice in a nutshell. Will we follow down the path of greed and hyperdevelopment, or will we protect our small town identity all while making our little town better than anybody could imagine? Thank you. Well, time, Mr. Burkett. Very good. Now, uh, Mr. Danziger. For yes, sir. Thank you, Doc. Actually, so I came prepared tonight, and I won't be reading my last email. Um, good evening, everybody. Thank you for being here tonight as we discuss the upcoming mayoral elections and the future of our town. I appreciate each of you for taking the time to inform yourselves about the candidates and their platform before making your decision in March. A special thank you to the League of Women Voters, Dr. Murphy, Dr. Lehman, maybe we just missed her, we, if we're going to be skipping the titles, uh, for hosting this event. But most importantly, thank you to my wife, my children, my brother slash business partner, my family, and my friends for their unwavering support throughout this journey. The accomplishments we've achieved in Surfside over the last two years wouldn't have been possible without you. I also want to acknowledge the, uh, the collaborative efforts of Vice Mayor Jeff Rose and Commissioner Fred Landsman. While we didn't always see eye to eye, our shared vision for a better Surfside and continued friendship, even through disagreements, propelled us forward, successfully achieving our set initiatives. 
A big shout out to our incredible town manager, Hector Gomez, and the hardworking staff here in Surfside. Their dedication has turned our vision into reality, significantly improving the town, resident experience, and overall quality of life. It's been a privilege to work alongside such amazing individuals, and we could not have accomplished all that we have without them. I also want to give a big shout out to our state representative and state senators who are tuning in tonight. The collaboration we've forged over the last two years and their dedication to our town and their district has helped us push approvals and funding through for many of our initiatives. For those of you who have been living under a rock, my name is Shlomo Danziger and I've had the honor and the privilege of serving as your mayor for the last two years. Many people say that I'm the best mayor in this town has ever had, but I'm really not one to brag. During the last two years, one of my objectives was to restore dignity and respect to the office, which disappeared when my opponent and his group ousted Mayor Daniel Deitch. Regardless of the policy disagreements, Mayor Deitch served our town with dignity for over a decade and was a role model for how an elected official should conduct themselves. But reestablishing decorum in our town meant enforcing rules, maintaining order, and exercising restraint, even when faced with false accusation. It hasn't been easy staying silent while my opponents spread lies. I've resisted singing, sinking to their level, believing that our town deserves better. In recent months, my opponent resurfaced with, uh, with familiar, disparaging emails, packed with negativity, half-truths, and hate. These emails aim to divide and, uh, our diverse community. Instead of engaging in mudslinging this election, I've chosen to focus on the historic achievements of my term. My opponent is a coward who hides behind the anonymity of a keyboard. But tonight, I have the opportunity to set the record straight. By the end of this evening, not only will I disprove and expose his lies, but I'll remind everybody why my opponent has been such a failure in the past. I'll remind everybody why Charles W. Burkett has been voted out of office five times. Thank you. Gentlemen, as we, as we move forward, I mean, I, I don't want to have these personal, personal statements being made. If you have differences in policies, or differences in the record that's been established here in, in, in town hall. I mean, that's what we're here to discuss, and, and I hope we can tone it down a little bit. So, I mean, we're, we're gonna move forward now with the first question, uh, which I'll, I'll begin with uh, Mr. Burkett, and then we'll reverse order back and forth. We'll, we'll ping pong the initial response. Um, this, this is uh, from an email. I'm going to read the, the question verbatim, and then we'll start the timing. Uh, it's a little bit of a long question. What steps will you take to address the recurring flooding issues in our town? What investments will you make in stormwater management infrastructure, such as upgrading drains? And what measures will you take to address the root causes of flooding, such as development in flood-prone areas or inadequate storm management? Mr. Burkett. Thank you. Uh, the flooding issue, the undergrounding issue, the 96th Street Park issue, those were all things that we tackled in the last commission. We designed that park, we designed the flooding solution, and we also designed the undergrounding. Okay. When we left office, we were hopeful that this administration under this mayor would continue that. They have either slow walked it or totally abandoned it. Recently, I guess in the last sort of several months, they've realized that there's an election coming up and there's been sort of a desperate effort to put together webinars to appear to be doing something on those subjects. But we still don't have a park on 96th Street. We still don't have any flooding solutions and we still don't have any undergrounding. Now, of course, I think you're gonna hear tonight that, oh, I tried to do the flooding, in, uh, I tried to get the flooding thing done, but you are the reason I couldn't do it. And he's going to say that the reason he couldn't do it was because he, he's not allowed to borrow any money. But that's not true either. Are we good? I got the time up. Yeah, she, All right. she flashed. Oh, I'm sorry. So I had more time. She gave you, you got 30 seconds, I think. We had a. No worries. Discue. Oh, okay. Well, sorry, Mr. Um. You know, again, I, I think the idea is is that there's some uh, obs obfuscation going on here, and I think that the, the answer is is we had a direction and a glide path to get all those projects done. This current commission decided that they wanted to cozy up with billionaires, and they wanted to do development, and they wanted to upzone Surfside instead of doing the uh, meat and potatoes stuff that we had put in process back when we were in office. 
Very good. All right. Um, Mr. Danziger, uh, do you want me to repeat the question or can we? If you don't mind. Would yes? you mind? Okay, yeah. What steps you would take to address the recurring flooding issues in our town? What investments will you make in stormwater management infrastructure, such as upgrading drains, and what measures will you take to address the root causes of flooding, such as development in flood prone areas or inadequate storm management, stormwater management? All right, I'll try to stick to the answers and not go off subject on this. Um, over the years, we've heard a lot about resilience. There's been a lot of talk, um, but nothing has actually been done. Um, as my opponent says, they planned, they funded. I can tell my kid that I put aside $20 for him to buy a Corvette, but it turns out you can't buy a car for $20. And that's kind of what we walked into. Um, they set aside $3.6 million for a flooding project that came back at $12 million. They funded a park for $2.5 million that ended up costing us eleven. million and so on and so forth. So we've had to start from scratch. We've had to reassess and evaluate the projects, and the same thing holds for undergrounding. It's very nice to say undergrounding is going to cost you $40 million, but if you don't study the project and how it affects every home, every driveway, every bush, you can't come up with an actual project. Uh, furthermore, they didn't even engage with AT&T, Atlantic Broadband, or any of the other um, uh, people that are involved in this project to see what it's going to cost to bring it down. So throwing pie in the sky numbers is irresponsible. It sounds nice when you're running for an election that you can say I funded it, but it's not actually funded. Um, we've actually moved forward with resilience. We've, uh, we're in the middle of uh, raising the dunes. We've uh, brought up the homes, uh, allowed for understories, creating more resilient homes. We've brought up the height restriction for our seawalls. So these are our weak points, and that's what we're working to strengthen. Um, we currently have an undergrad um, uh, flooding project, but as the former mayor said, you know, they did lock us in, and coming in at $12.5 million, we don't have that money, so it looks like we're going to have to move forward for a referendum, which is what the residents seem to want, because they don't want to let us borrow money, so that will have to move forward in order for us to resolve the flooding issue. What I can say is there's a lot of uh, things mobile and, in, and currently active, as opposed to just ideas, and we hope to come back and finish them off. Very good. I mean, this next question, I'm going to begin with Mr. Danziger. And it's, and it's somewhat related here because it says Surfside declared a climate emergency in 2019. And at that same time, it adopted a climate cri crisis report and action plan. Um, it's according to the report and the plan, he's asking what specific actions will you champion as mayor to produce results according to the plan, if, if that's part of your priority? So we've adopted a lot of the policies from that plan, um, but some of those policies in, uh, require upgrading to our infrastructure and a lot of the bigger projects. What I've been doing on my trips to Tallahassee is getting funding from the state for some of these projects. Um, just the other day, I came back from a $3 million request that we were asking for, for our water mains and infrastructure. It's going to require outside help, and that's what we're currently um, working to do. Okay, um, same question, Mr. Burkett, regarding the uh, Surfside declared a climate emergency in 2019 and adopted a climate crisis report and action plan. Mm -hmm. And I'd ask if you've read this and, whether, and what your specific actions or plans are to implement the uh, action plan. Uh, well, I first want to go back to that last question that we were finishing on. I just didn't have enough time to say, at the end of the day, with all the undergrounding and all the flooding and all those projects that the, the current mayor was just talking about, there are no results. You know, you can talk a lot, you can explain a lot, you can say you went to Tallahassee a lot, but at the end of the day, residents want results, okay? And that's what we don't have right now, so we don't have results. As far as that report goes, um, I have not read that report, but I have heard about that report, and we were committed to Raising the house levels, I agree with that. I think that's important. I think everything really at the end of the day has to go up. So I'm supportive of anything we need to do to strengthen our resilience as far as, you know, the rising tide issue is, is facing us. So, um, you know, there's not a lot that we can do as a town. I think, yeah, raising the seawalls. When someone fixes their seawall, the seawall goes up. When someone builds a house, I think, you know, the house goes up. But that's another problem that we have, and I think we're going to talk about that tonight, and that's the designs of these houses and how it impacts the community and how it impacts the neighbors. So it's, it's an important subject. I, I completely support it, and uh, I think we need to talk more about it. Very good. Uh, this next question, starting with Mr. Burkett. 
Um, given the growth of our community, we find that the infrastructure lacks the ability to manage the needs of the business district specifically with a lack of parking. With only approximately 630 spots in town and at least half of them are required for staff and owners of these businesses, let alone all of the free parking awarded to the residents, it leaves very little for the district to conduct business. It says, once 1030 arrives, we are not able to get our clients into the business district since they are not able to park. What solution should we expect to see? Well, I, I think that that is a significant problem. And I think we have to start with the basics. Um, you know, in the last 27 years that I've lived in Surfside, okay, we have a certain number of people living here. We have a certain number of people going to the businesses. And, you know, the parking hasn't been a tremendously big problem. Since Bal Harbor kept raising their parking prices and we kept ours low, we basically had an influx of a lot of those parkers that want cheaper rates. And one of the solutions that um, was out there but didn't get done before our commission was over was to get those prices raised up. You know, I, I instituted free parking for every resident in Surfside when I was the mayor a couple times ago because I think that's important. I think if people want to come shop, they should be encouraged to come shop. But what we did in the past, too, is we, we sold our parking spaces and we encouraged developers to build without providing parking on their site. So, you know, it's, it's the kind of thing that goes on with irresponsible politicians who allow builders to go ahead and create projects that build buildings but don't build the necessary parking that goes along with it. And that's the kind of short-sightedness that I've been very concerned about. That's the kind of short-sightedness I see when you have this mayor who takes a project across the street here and says to the developer, well, you're only allowed to build two floors of housing on that site. But when they come up with a workaround and, then, and you know, you got the vice mayor that says, well, listen, we can figure out a way to get them more units. So what happens is, is basically they pretend like there's a religious institution going into that. And then all of a sudden they're allowed to build underground parking. And voila, guess what? They go from two floors of units to three floors of units. Okay. And that is a problem because we're adding more and more people into a fixed space. And you know what happens when you do that? There is a limit. There is a limit to the number of people that we can cram into Surfside because Miami Beach has done it and they've destroyed their quality of life. And so has Sunny Isles. And I don't want that to happen here. Mr. Danziger, um, on this question of parking in the downtown business district. So I think we all know what the solution is for a lack of parking, but it doesn't seem like this town is ready to have that conversation. That's been very clear. Um, but I want to talk about the construction and development for a second. The zoning allowances for the home, contrary to what my opponent says, has remained the same for the last 20 years. It has not changed at all. We're still limited to 40% on the first floor, 80% on the top of that, and the home is restricted to 30 feet from the crown of the road. That has not changed throughout our term, and that hasn't changed in 20 years. We've never given variances for any commercial projects that we approved here in Surfside over the last two years, and everybody built what they were allowed to by code. All the vice mayor's projects were approved that you see going up in town were approved from 2020 to 21 with only two of them approved over the last two years. We've negotiated a record amount of proffers for the towns, millions of dollars that go to benefit our towns also requiring they contribute to sponsoring projects like dune restoration, water resiliency improvements, sidewalk, street repair, the water mains, water pumps, outdoor exercise equipment on the beach, parks, beach path safety, lighting through our town, all sponsored and negotiated with developers who were only approved to build what they were allowed by right with no special treatment. My opponent says he's gonna stop construction. So I'd love to ask him how. In the last four years, 60 homes have been approved. Not even half of them are currently under construction, which means we still have about 30 or 40 left to go. The town has major projects in the works, like 96th Street Park, Resident Gym and Pickleball Center on 88th Street, Champlain Memorial, Townwide Flood Drainage Project, Traffic Calming and Walkability. Major commercials projects that are currently in queue are the Surf House, Regent Palace Market Hall, Collins Avenue project across the street here, the new Damoc building. These projects alone will keep this town under construction for the next 10 years, and unfortunately there's nothing anybody can do from stop this from happening. My opponent continues to tell people that th what they want to hear and makes empty promises he can't keep. The fact is he is a developer. He wants this job so he can benefit from it and rub elbows with the big people. Why do you think he keeps investing $10,000 of his own money into his campaign? He needs the position to further his personal and financial gains. 
It's an investment for him and not for our community. It's an investment for the Burkhead companies and development and management. I'm raising my family here in Surfside and I'll continue to invest in our community. A long time ago. That was, that, 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 that's, that's really crazy. No, that, Mr. That's Mr. crazy talk. Let's, let's not level these kind of allegations. No. Personally. Save it. I mean, you can have you can have different really? issues. Let's go to the next question. But let's let's not personalize it like this. the The next question is kind of in the same vein. the The citizens asking, what needs to be addressed in the downtown business district? Walkability, cleanliness, parking, upgrading. So, what needs to be addressed, and what's your plan for that, Mr. Danziger? Sounds like the same question to me. It's, it's close. So what's the different? Question provided by the citizens here. So again, I'm going to need to hear the difference between this question and the last, because I can read through this paper again if you guys want. I have a different answer. Okay, Mr. I'm happy Burkett. to answer the question. Yeah. Um, you know, we had a, we, we've got an in, in important job with our downtown. We've got an amazing, historic, wonderful downtown. My opponent went up to Tallahassee recently and said to a panel of, uh, of elected officials that he was busy upzoning Surfside until this Live Local came around, and now he's considering not doing that, okay? But what he was talking about was adding apartments and more things in the downtown, building it up, making it bigger. But I'm just in the middle right now of an issue where we've got a tenant that he's been dealing with for two years that has so little space that they've rented, they're trying to run a business in a small space that really needs a space two or three times the size. So what I'm, the answer to your question is, is we need to allocate space in the downtown district correctly, number one. Number two, we need to have rules, okay, that incentivize property owners to build out those spaces so they're properly sized for the properly uh, uh, attributed tenant. You can't have a tenant right now that's trying to run a business in a 10,000 square foot a space that needs a 20,000 square foot office uh, space or, or, a, or a box that's 20,000 feet. But that's what's going on now in our downtown. So that's creating a problem. So between the upzoning that he's been promoting, okay, and the space issues that we already have, we don't need to be adding to that problem. We need to be solving the problem of the space. We need to be solving the problem of renovating what we've got, not adding to what we've got, and making it more beautiful, not making it bigger. I'm very confused by that answer. But as far as we're not, we shouldn't upzone, but people need more space, but they have less space. So it's very confusing. Uh, I'll explain piece, it to you if you want. It's all right. Um, but I'm going to talk about the downtown, the Live Local, because that is what was touched on. And this commission got ahead of Live Local thanks to my involvement in that uh, bill and being, you know, actually the only elected official in Miami Dade County who was involved in this at the beginning. Um, instead of putting forward uh, the moratoriums that a lot of other cities did that will fail, what we did is we created uh, lot sizes for our downtown district. We set them at 50 linear feet. If they want to uh, join those properties, they're going to have to get approval from the commission. That would be based on project. And if they want to build a live local, which we can't stop theoretically because it's a commercial-based um, district, they're subject to the setbacks of the H120, which means 20 feet on each side. So good luck building a live local that is 10 feet wide. So this commission has been very proactive in ensuring and protecting our downtown district and our entire community. Okay, this next question uh, to Mr. Burkett. What specific strategies will you implement to alleviate traffic congestion? How will you address bottlenecks and choke points on major roads to improve traffic flow and how will you balance the need for economic growth and development with the need to reduce traffic congestion? I'd like to use the example of a party at your house. You've got a living room, okay? And if you've got six people in your living room, it's fun. If you've got 12 people in your living room, it's, it's crowded. If you've got 24 people in your living room, it's tight. And if you've got 48 people in your living room, the party's over, okay? The party's over in Miami Beach, the party's over in Sun Isles, but the party's not over here yet. But if these guys stay in charge, the party will be over because it's all about incrementalism with these guys. They want a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit here, a little bit there, and by the time you're finished, You've built the whole place out and it's over. You know, add a little bit on the downtown, put some apartments on top, 
you know, add a fifth, add 50 percent more units over here across the street because, you know, and, and the mayor said, listen, we never changed any zoning. Of course he did. That's not the truth. The truth is, is the project across the street right here was allowed to be built with parking on the surface plus two stories of units. They came up with a clever fix. They came to this commission and they said, oh, you know what? We'll put a teeny tiny little synagogue in there. But in order to do that, we've got to change the law. They all voted to come here and change the law. They changed the law. He says they didn't do variances. They, they literally changed the law. So now the law has changed. And now this developer can put a teeny tiny little religious facility in there. And all of a sudden, ipso facto, he can build underground parking. What does that do? That gives him three levels of saleable units instead of two. But what does that do to our crowds? That makes Surfside that much more crowded. And that's the kind of mindset that I'm not for. I'm for, listen, let's build what we've always allowed to be built. Okay, we don't need to add more people. We need to make it better for the people that are here. That's what we need to do, and that's what I intend to do if I become mayor again. Mr. Danziger, would you like to respond to this question on, on the particular site that he referenced? Um, yeah, if I can respond to that. So first of all, saying something up here doesn't make it truth. Um, people were at that meeting. Again, no variances, no differences. Um, just for the information, for those watching, the property next door, I think, required 160 parking spaces. They put in 185, and people complain that they're creating too many parking places. So again, I think it's beneficial that we have more parking than less, and that's what they've done. Okay. Um, but to the point of what the question was, first of all, I mean, again, to respond to one of those comments, I've, you know, at the risk of, of putting myself in danger with the fire code, I've had more than 24 people in my living room, and it was a great party. Um, but whatever. <laughs> The point of traffic, and that is something that we really ran to address, right? Pedestrian safety, walkability, and the cut through traffic that we are um, experiencing now, which it looks like it's only going to get it worse if this Live Local in Bell Harbor goes through. After the Champlain Tower South, Surfside turned into a thoroughfare. People found Byron Avenue, Carlisle, and they've been running up at crazy speeds. We've, unfortunately, these are not our roads. This belongs to the county. Collins and Harding belong to the state. There is a process for us to go through. So what we did is we had to upgrade our uh, traffic study. The last one was done in 2012. In order for us to submit plans to the county for approval, we've had to redo our traffic study, which was a 10-month process. We're currently in the design phase, and then we're going to submit plans to the county, which will hopefully alleviate and stop the traffic through our town. It will come up, but we've actually had a couple of workshops so far. I hope the residents will stay engaged with that as we present the different uh, proposals and solutions. All that was very nice, but he didn't answer the question. See, he changed the law. That was the change in zoning. See, he, he, he's cute. He says that, uh, excuse me, excuse me. Thank you. Excuse me. He, he had the opportunity to respond and responded. Yeah, no, no, that's good. It's good. But I just want to make it clear. He didn't answer the question. And, you know, that's, that's the issue. Okay, let's, let's, let's move on. We're, we got a... Another question that uh, actually had to do with crime in this town. So we'll get it. We'll, we'll switch topics a little bit since it sounds kind of repetitive. These questions. I'm sorry, but it says with the increase in theft around the town, what is the plan of action to, to decrease this? Mr. Danziger, to start with you today on this. Wow. Anyway, I hope you're not starting the timer yet. Um, so crime in this community, we are, thankfully we have a small town, we have a very dedicated police department. Um, we've been fortunate or unfortunate to go through police, uh, three police chief changes in the last two years, um, but they've only been getting better and better, and our current chief is instituting a lot of different new policies and procedures in place. Um, but again, this is one of the opportunities to address some of the misinformation by my opponent. He went around and told people he's going to increase police coverage and response time, and I have some information here that may be useful. This is a graph right here of our uh, police patrols. This is a GPS graph that we were tracking their cars in a 24-hour period. This is 99.9% .9 of the community that was covered. My opponent said that there's no patrols here. This data, again, is public record. You can ask for it. Our officers are around, and our command staff is tracking them because we're continuously looking to improve. A couple of stats. Um, Non-emergency uh, non average response time for Miami-Dade County is 21.2 minutes, and Surfside, it's three minutes. The emergency response time, the national average is eight and a half minutes, Miami-Dade County is 5.46, and Surfside is 2.23.
We have over 1,700 parking tickets that have been issued on Harding Avenue alone in the last month. Our police department continues to provide top-level service to our residents, and they continue to work on improving themselves. So the level of service to our residents and the safety will be second to none. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Burkett. I think, I think anybody that uh, has been living in Surfside for any length of time, you know, the mayor held up his graph that it was meaningless as far as I'm concerned. I think people feel it. They know it. Um, they know when they see police officers in town. We had cops riding bikes in our residential area. We had lots of police coverage. We had thousands more tickets being given when I was the mayor on Collins Avenue for speeders than we have right now. You know, there was a, a seriously different sort of effect with respect to police. And you know what? It wasn't as good as I wanted. It needs to be better. Okay, but now it's kind of fallen off. And I think that most residents know and the people watching on TV know that they don't often see a police officer driving by their house. When I was living here 27 years ago, you could almost see them come by on an hourly basis, and it was reassuring. And by the way, the police also came uh, very, very quickly. I don't know about this two-minute response time. I think that two minutes would be wonderful if, if that was true, but I don't know that that's the experience of many of our residents because that's, that's a key thing. So as far as police goes, police protection, uh, robberies, uh, car thefts, bike thefts, you know, those have been a significant issue in the last couple years. And we need to do better than that. We need to do better. We need to focus on that. I've had conversations with the police chief. Um, you know, we, he and I have discussed that issue. He's aware of that. And he said that uh, he's working on it. So, and I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, Mr. Burkett, this next question, starting with you, is somewhat related. What are your, what's your stance on illegal dumping around the town and the empty <laughs> Oh, that's, that's. Rain, or how do you plan to address it? That's a, pr <laughs> you know, that, that, you know, illegal dumping. We, uh, we, we have, you know, our vice mayor is, is, is the number one guy. I mean, there are pictures circulating around town. He's got lots in town and he's had violations. That lot has, he hasn't because he's clever. See, he doesn't own the lot but he uses the lot and the guy that has that owns the lot has been given violations and they've been, they spent years trying to get this lot cleaned up. So, you know, do we have dumping in, in Surfside? I, I think we have dumping occasionally residents put stuff out, but as far as like a, a real dump that you would drive by and think that's a dump on an empty lot, that's the vice mayor. That's what we've got. But you know, code enforcement has to do a good job. They have to do a better job. They have to be gentle with residents that have problems. They have to go out of their way to try to solve problems, not punish residents. And that's what code enforcement needs to do. Code enforcement needs to be there to help, okay? Sometimes you have people that, that won't do what they're supposed to do, and there needs to be an escalating sort of level of, of uh, discipline that needs to be instilled. But the bottom line is, is we need to make sure that, you know, there is no dumping, that code enforcement works, that they work with residents, and that the vice mayor cleans up his construction sites. That's what we need to do. Mr. Danzinger, I mean, is there an issue of illegal dumping on residential lots, and do you have a plan to cure it? A plan to cure it. So this is a loaded question um, aimed to give my opponent a segue to attack the vice mayor. Illegal dumping is illegal. Um, we'll start with that. And we have an amazing code enforcement team that is out there seven days a week. I think everybody knows that. Maybe it's a little uh, excessive. They are out there all the time. They are giving out tickets. We get those reports weekly. Um, there is no illegal dumping. And if there is any infractions, um, you can rest assured that our town is on top of these issues. Okay. This is a uh, when this is personal. I've had, there's, there's a number of issues that uh, residents have raised relating to the water and sewer bill uh, that they're receiving, that they seem that the, there's an excessive uh, charges coming in on the water and sewer bill, or the rates have increased, or the, what they're paying has increased. Is there an issue here with the municipality in terms of the retail rates on, on sewer and water service? Mr. Danzinger, we'll start with you. All right, I'll take that. Um... What the residents are feeling is the result of bad policy and bad politicians in the future in the, in the past. Our water bill, we have to pay that to Miami-Dade County, was going up and the bill was getting higher and higher, but the politicians didn't want to raise the rate. 
And what happened at one point when we started hitting the red line is we had to suddenly increase it dramatically. And I'm a resident. We all saw our water bill, what felt like it doubled, and it hurt us. Um, but those were the rates that we're paying as a town, and the account was negative. What I can say is through some uh, creative uh, projects from our town manager, um, we were able to take this water bill that was in the red when we got in and projected to stay in the red for the next five years. We were able to put that back in the black over the last year. And that wasn't done through uh, going after residents. Those were things, for example, the stormwater drains. There was an improvement project. We saved, I think it's something like $7,000 a day just in processing um, rainwater in our sewer drain, which was leaking in there. So again, these are um, very big projects. This is just um, the result of inflation that we did, just didn't catch up to. Okay. Mr. Burkett, on that same question. Yeah. The water, and sewer um, the water bills are, are killing a lot of residents, especially the less affluent residents. And this has been a problem for a long time. And uh, I don't know about being in the black. You know, what, what my opponent is saying is that- It's amazing. My opponent doesn't seem to know anything about the budget. Okay. All right. Well, it's your opinion. That's nice. But anyway. Let's not uh, you talk know, over each other, please. Silly. Um, you know, the, 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 the charges are a function of a decision made at the commission level. Okay. So the commission pays for water from Dade County. They buy it. They buy water and they pay 10 cents a gallon. And the commission can say, well, listen, we'll charge 10 cents a gallon or we'll charge 50 cents a gallon. And that way we'll cover other expenses in the city. So they'll utilize the charge, the water charge to offset other charges, including some some bond issue that was done um, when I was not the mayor, which I did not support. Okay, that that was that that drove up the cost too because there's a mortgage there, there's a loan, there's an amount that's due that's being paid with that water bill too. But the point is, is we can reduce the water bills for our residents with some creative arrangement. Okay, and make sure that the less affluent of our neighbors and our residents don't pay a disproportionately high amount for water. So there is a way to balance that out. Now, I, I don't think my opponent wants to do that or cares to do that, but that's something that I've promised that I would do, and that's something that I will do. I think what we need more now is more than promises, but actual plan of action. Um, I don't think my opponent understands the difference between an enterprise fund and a general fund. Um, the expenses are required to be paid back. So how are we going to offset that? Are the rich going to pay for the poor? I would love to hear that. So, Rather than so, just so my, out of turn. my opponent is, is talking, what he's talking about are results. And I agree with that. You know, you can talk a lot. You can, you can twist yourself into a pretzel. You can do bat flips. But the bottom line is, is let's get, let's get a result. Okay. And that's, that's what I'm talking about. And he hasn't gotten the results. He hasn't put the power lines underground. He hasn't fix the flooding. He hasn't finished the park. And that's not a result. And that's, you know, at the end of the day, that's what we need. We need a result. So that's where we're at. I'm sorry I couldn't get a five-year project done in the last year and a half. I apologize. Let's go to the next question. We have, we have a question on parks and playgrounds. It says, with so many young children moving in, we want to keep our neighborhood safe and walkable. What are you doing to accommodate these families? What should be kept in place for future commissions and what should be changed? I'll be starting with you, Mr. Burkett. Could you read that again, that question again? I know, I'm reading it. My question is about the parks and playgrounds. With so many young children in, moving in, we want to keep our neighborhood safe and walkable. What are you doing to accommodate these families? Well, listen, I, I've said in my campaign material that one of my main focuses is going to be on programs for the kids and programs for the seniors. And that includes making great parks. Okay, we've got a park that's under construction right now. It's probably going to be done in six months, and that's exciting. That's a park that we designed in my commission. That's a park that we funded in my commission, and that's a park that this, this commission has been building out, which is good. Okay, they're, they're moving it along, but I don't think it's going to be done um, for the next six months. But once it's done, it's going to be terrific. I think we need more programs over at our community center. I think we need green walking paths to make sure it's safe to go to your religious institution, it's safe to go shopping, and it's safe to go to the beach. We need to paint those. We need to continue that because we had a little bit of that several years ago, but it didn't get finished. So as far as the parks go, uh, it's the community center, it's the tennis center, it's the tot lot, it's the 96th Street Park. All those things need to be firing on all eight cylinders. We need to have great programs. We've got a great parks and recreation director. 
He does a great job. He's been here for a long, long time. He knows what the needs are, and we need to enhance that because that's what we're here for. We're here to make the lives of our residents better. Mr. Danzinger, on the issue of parks and what we be for young families that are moving in here. So the nice thing is I don't have to talk about a campaign. I can actually talk about what we've done here. Um, we have a plan, yes. You know, like I said, with the park, everybody funded it a little bit, but we had to carry it over the line. And it cost us $4.5 million additional to what's been funded over the last 10 years. So to say that it was done when we walked in is, in, uh, is not accurate. We have had to go out for the RFP twice. We've had to readjust it, and then we got it done because that's what we're about. We're not about changing the slides out. Um, we're a commission full of... 96th Street Park. Okay. Um, just uh, for the records, the residents understand, we've increased our parks program to 47 programs for adults and children. We've added senior programs. We've even created a senior liaison so we can better understand the needs of our senior community and we can uh, accommodate them. With the finishing of the park, hopefully in February, we will be able to open up a community center there and move our camps there and so we can continue our senior programmings throughout the summer uh, months. Walkability, and like you said, family. I, I'm the only one sitting up here that has little kids, all right? This has been a priority of mine since I started running for six years ago, actually, since I was involved in the town, and this is something that I'm gonna finish. Um, as we spoke about in one of the previous uh, items, it takes time, it has to be submitted to the county, there's a process, but this is something that I wanna finish. Walkability, our town has more children riding their bikes to school. We have a religious community that walks every weekend. We became a walkable town, but we're not accommodating to that, and that's something that I wanna finish. Well, there's actually a very next question had to do with walkability, if I can throw it out there, because it says, what are your plans for walkability on the sidewalks in the downtown area? It has exploded with tables and chairs, signs, electric scooters, skateboards, bicycles, baby strollers, et cetera. So what are your plans going forward on the walkability in the downtown? Well, is that to me or to? Yes, yeah, it's to me. Okay. I think the downtown is a very important subject, and I think it needs to be looked at holistically. I think that, uh, you know, once we can dispense with the, si the silliness of making it bigger and adding apartments and upzoning it, and I think that's going to go away with this election, we can get to what's important, and that is, is restore it, make sure the parking is there for the people that want to go, make sure that we don't have people that shouldn't be parking in downtown parking there and doing whatever we need to do to make sure that happens. We need to go ahead, as far as the walkability goes, you know, there's a plan that we talked about when I was the mayor, and we, you know, we were trying to put together a design by the time I left office, but we couldn't. Um, this commission has put together a plan, presumably, to take away parking spaces in the downtown and widen sidewalks, but nobody's seen that. I haven't seen it. It hasn't been in the Gazette, just like the Tennis Center hasn't been in the Gazette. So really, you know, these are all projects that, that are sort of dreamt up here in Town Hall, but aren't sort of like shared out to the residents at large for their buy-in. You see, I've been a regular resident for the past two years, and I've been waiting to see what the plan is for the Tennis Center. I've been waiting to see what the plan is for the downtown, and I still haven't seen it. So I can't answer that. But what I will tell you is that after the election, if I'm elected mayor, we'll go back to the drawing board, we'll sit down with the residents, we'll get the input, we'll have the roundtables, we'll put an idea together, and we'll get something done. We'll get a result. That's what we'll do. Mr. Danziger. So you know, when I ran last time, I actually educated myself about everything that was going on in town. I learned the budget, and I didn't come here just talking, you know, I don't know. I actually knew everything that was happening here. Uh, my opponent talks about going back to the drawing board, and that's been his legacy. We came in here and got things done. The downtown district needed to be redone. Um, there's been multiple, multiple uh, workshops on that. It's been the Gazette many times. Um, and we had a downtown walkability project, which we, was, was on our first budget item, actually, um, when we first got into office. We're going to widen the sidewalks. Um, we put out a survey. People were complaining that there was no room to walk, but they also didn't want to do anything about it. Um, but we are going to widen the sidewalks. We're going to enhance the downtown walkability. Tourist, do uh, tourist dollars play a big role in our town, and I think people underestimate that. 
Um, our entire pro uh, Parks and Recreation Department is funded through the tourist dollars. It pays for our CSAs that we've just hired and many other great initiatives that are covered through tourist dollars. Um, I think we used to roll in a couple hundred thousand dollars a year. We're at almost seven million dollars a year on tourism. And that's gone to many different programs that enhance our quality of life. And I think residents need to remember that. And we need to foster that growth and that opportunity that the downtown represents. Thank we need to spend that money wisely. There is a lot more money, and that money needs to be spent wisely. Just because there's a lot of money doesn't mean you shovel it out the door, okay? And that's, uh, we haven't seen anything in the Gazette. There may have been a couple words in the Gazette, but there are no plans, there are no schematics, there are no drawings. It's there all are, out there. It's, there, all it's out. not. There there's are, actually a, a there's page not. on our town website. It's called the Capital Improvement I said Gazette. Projects, I said there. Gazette. So, yeah. and I, it's been in the Gazette. That's what's important. Okay. Uh, also, just for uh, for the information purposes, tourist dollars is extremely restricted on what you can spend it on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Mr. Dan, this next question will start with you. This is, I think the town of Surfside is a very civically engaged community, no doubt about it, But and this may have been a League of Women Voters plant question, but it says, how will you encourage residents to be involved in community meetings, registering to vote, and hearing their concerns? What will you specifically be doing or planning to do to encourage residents to be involved in the community meetings, registering to vote, and hearing their concerns? Starting you with you, Mr. Dan. So first of all, one of the things that we're very proud of that we're just starting now is a, is a youth council. Um, that is something that has been lacking in this town. It's been on my to-do list for quite a while. Um, and thankfully, one of the residents came up and stepped up and took lead on that. And we're going to be initiating that very shortly. And that's going to engage a whole other part of this community. Um, but I think that touches on a little bit of decorum, right? Because I came into office and we all saw what we had. Um, my opponent is, you know, very, very displaying a lot of it up here and it didn't get, uh, it wasn't much better back then. So I want to ask um, how many residents here actually stay and attend for the entire commission meeting? How many of them are watching the entire thing from their homes? And, the, you know, not the 30 second clips my opponent goes ahead and sends out there. Um, my opponent and the opposition claim that residents are not allowed to talk here. However, if you've been watching, you will see that I sit here. Can I get some time back, please? Yeah. Let's go. Let's just take it back from the beginning. So if you've been watching these meetings, you'll see that I've been sitting here meeting after meeting, being insulted by the people that get up here. All right? Right to my face. And every time they finish, they say thank you. They sit down, they get up, and they do it all over again, as long as they maintain the rules and address those comments to the chair or the commission as a whole. In the past two years, I've actually only thrown out four people. Two for repeated violation of the rules after multiple warnings, including my opponent who thinks the rules don't apply to him, and one for flipping me off and making verbal threats at me, and the other for saying the F word on the air multiple times, and when I asked him to stop, he told me to go F myself. Those are the four people we threw out of this meeting. Our town of government should be held to a certain modicum of respect. Town hall meetings are not a circus, and that's exactly what they were when my opponent was in office. My, uh, my opponent cannot maintain decorum in town meetings, and commission meetings used to be a free-for-all. Nothing was accomplished. The last agenda was up to triple C's. All right, This was their last agenda in March. It just kept getting rolled over and rolled over because they accomplished nothing. My commission gets through our entire agenda every single time. Legislation is our duty and our priority, and the budget amendment needs to be passed so the town can spend money on things like pool heaters so the town can continue, continue to provide services to our residents. If you can't get through a meeting, you're failing our residents. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Jones. All right. I, I'd, like, I'd like to respond to that. Well, no, Mr. Burkett, the, the if you question, can't, if you can't. Let me repeat the question, yeah. please. I wish, I, wish, I wish we would not do these outbursts. These outbursts are not helpful, the shouting. By the way, give me the gavel, and I'll have this room in order in a second. You know. Let's, please, please, come on, please. Aren't you an elected official? I'm going to repeat the question and Thank now you. for Mr. Burkett. If elected, how will you encourage residents to be involved in the community meetings, registering to vote, and hearing their concerns? You know, I, I, you know, I think that, that there's a style. There's a style. And... Uh, Yes, he is. Uh, what's What's funny is 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 hypocrisy is is what we're talking about here. You know, this gentleman gets up at every meeting 
and and preaches about decorum and respect and lectures all of our residents about who they need to talk to, who they need to address their comments to, and how things are done. And then what he does is he interrupts them if they don't do exactly what he says, and then he tells, tells them three times, you, that's one, two, three, and you're gone. But you know what's funny, Terry? This gentleman- Dr. Murphy. Came in here and basically ran up to the podium, he's on video doing it, and screamed at one of the commissioners and did exactly what he prevents other people from doing. But they don't scream. They just talk. Yeah, and you know, he, th he, he threw me out because instead of addressing him and saying, you know, Fred, you shouldn't have done this or you did that, that's what I got thrown out for because I was talking about Fred Landsman and that was something that he didn't like. So what he did was he made up a rule and said, you're out. And that cut off the conversation. That meant that I didn't get to say what I needed to say. And that meant that a lot of people that had been cut off, thrown out, asked to sit down, didn't get what to say what they wanted to say. And that's a real problem. That is a real problem. So that's not something that we're going to have in the future. Because we didn't have it in the past. Yeah, we, we had some noise. We, we did have some noise, okay? So, you, you know, you guys are interrupting. Yeah, please, please, please. Okay? We had some noise. But you, but you know what? You know what's interesting? We never had decisions that were made before we got to the dais, okay? And that's the difference. We had discussions on the dais, okay? They've got smooth meetings and they get things done. Jody. Time up. Yeah. Thank right. you. If I could respond to that. First of all, these are not my, my rules. Um, those are the rules that are written on our charter, and it's actually the chair's job that's literally in the charter to maintain the rules of decorum. Um, what my opponent is referencing is to is actually, it's a good, uh, a good example, is when I was a resident. I wasn't the mayor. He was the mayor, actually, and he didn't do a job of maintaining decorum, of enforcing the rules, enlightening residents of the rules, educating the rules. That's the job, and he was a failure back then, and that's why I came in here to fix. Actually, actually, I'd like to respond to that. Um, I did enforce the rules, but I did it in a different way. Mm -hmm. I did it in a way that didn't deny people the right to say what they wanted to say. What we've got here is we've... <laughs> we've okay, guys. Okay. Hey, I'm going to enforce the rules. Yeah, We're moving yeah, on to the next question. Just stop right there. We're going we're gonna to start with this next question. It's Mr. Burkett. It's your question. Sure. Starts out. I'm going to read it verbatim. It has to do with procurement and the, and the bidding processes in play here. I've noticed that very little, if anything, is competitively bid by the town, often including items of significant expenditure, and despite what is probably an existing requirement to do so. Would you agree to eliminate the ability to waive the bidding process for any expenditure of greater than 100000 with the only exception been, being when we are piggybacking on another municipality's bidding process that is not older than six months? That's the question asking, would you put limitations on the uh, ability to waive the bidding process? Or if you believe I, I, I don't think we ever waived the bidding process when I was the mayor. I don't, I don't recall ever doing that, but I do recall now that that gets done all the time with this commission. And there, the problem is, is that a lot of the people doing the work at this commission, for this commission, have relationships. And that's why the lack of bidding is so problematic. Okay, those people that are doing the work for this commission, for this town right now, may well be the best ones to do it. But you can't waive the bidding. You've got to go out and get other bids. You've got to go out and get other prices. You've got to do that. That's your obligation as a steward of the tax money, of the residents' money. So I know it's easier to just waive it and have a guy that you're friendly with or you know or you're comfortable with or whatever the relationship is to do it. But that's not cool. And I don't think that 100,000, I think that's a ridiculously high number. I think the, the, the cutoff number should be much, much lower. 
That's my opinion. Uh, Mr. Danziger, on the issue of the bidding process and the waiver of bids. So there is a requirement for municipalities to uh, go through a bidding project for a bidding process for our projects. There is also the ability to jump on and piggyback off existing bids that were done by other municipalities. Um, this is utilized sometimes when you have emergency projects that have to be moved forward and don't go through a lengthy RFP process. People have to remember that's a minimum 45 to 65 day process of an RFP review. So depending on the project, if there's a need to move that forward, sometimes the cities can go ahead and piggyback off an existing RFP. But I think this has to do a little bit or a lot with transparency in government, and I think that's what I'm hearing. Um, moving forward, all elected officials are gonna be required to fill out a form six. I highly doubt my opponent is going to be able to fill that out, considering he can't even fill out his basic confidential, his basic statement of financial interest is Form 1, whose top interest is confidential, for those of you that didn't see it. So I don't know how he's going to create an environment of transparent government when we don't even know what he does himself. He sends in his email about a $14 million, excuse me, he sends in his email about a $14 million Miami Beach trophy property, he said. This is his words. Go to the property appraiser, it's actually $805,000. So my question for Chuck over here is, are you lying then or are you lying to them or are you lying to us? Beautiful. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about it. It's, it's silly, right? I mean, it's really silly. Very silly. Chuck? These are facts, ladies Chuck, and gentlemen. Okay, let's go fact number one. Let's, let's go through the facts. The fact, I, fact, I'm going to let this go on because you well, apparently want... Yeah, I do. I, 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 listen, he, he's, he's being cute and he's waiving the financial disclosure, which everybody I'll sees. Let, I'll let you respond I, to Thank it. you. I appreciate it, doctor. Let's I, I, think that, I think that everybody has seen everybody's financial disclosure, including mine. Okay? Mine says that I have a family limited partnership that owns all of my nationwide properties. Okay. It also says that last year. It also says confidential settlement. Okay. I, I, I'm getting to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Let, I mean, let him explain. You made, a lot of, you made a lot of accusations here. Let the man explain them. Yeah. Thank you. So the confidential settlement thing was a, a, an issue I was involved in where I signed an agreement that I said would remain confidential. Now, this will make my opponent happy. If he wants to file a suit in court and demand that it be unconfidential, I'm very happy with that because I don't really care. I'm very happy and I'm, I'm quite satisfied with everybody knowing what that confidential settlement was because I got no problem with it, okay? But the other party that was involved required that and that can only be undone by a judge, but let's have at it. I'll tell you what, I will agree to help you get that done, if that makes you feel better. The other thing was, is the trophy. The residence, not to me. Uh -huh, yeah, yeah, you brought it up. The other thing is the trophy property. That property was smashed by a, uh, a hurricane in 2017. We had to replace four balconies on the front. It, it became a design review thing. Miami Beach is very strict about the way buildings are repaired. We, had to, we couldn't just fix it, so we ended up having to file for permits. Right at the end, we were told that you're not going to be able to get your permits issued because you got to go in front of design review. We, we started that whole process, and then guess what happened? COVID hit. COVID hit, and that shut us down for another year. So by the time we got started again, it was another year gone, and there was so, then it was time for the 40-year recertification for the building. So with all that work going on, I had to move all the tenants out, and what happened was the building ended up being empty while we were working on it, and the property tax assessor reduced the assessment because it was empty and not making any money. We petitioned for that reduction. So he's right. So we're, say, we're not paying taxes on a building that's not operating right now, but the building, the good news is the building has been completely repaired, it's completely done, it's completely operating, and it's all good. And by the way, when you check- Completely in, lost its value, by the way. If you look at the, I said it's also completely lost its value if you look at the property. Well, well, that's, well listen, I'm very happy to pay taxes on $800,000 worth of value as long as they want to maintain that. I don't think it's eight hundred either. I think it's about a million and a half. But anyway, mm. needless to say, that building, $287. That building, that building would sell today for $15 million. So listen, the bottom line is, is it's, it, it, you know what it is? It's a technicality, and that's the, the best. The building he's value is ten thousand four hundred seventy-one dollars. Okay, guys, coming down from one million eighty-three. Guys, yeah, let, yeah, let, yeah. 
let it's 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 a 16 unit $20,000 20,000 square foot apartment building it's not worth $10,000 I assure you so these kind of silly comments are a distraction away from what's really important tonight and if that's the best he's got then he's got a problem okay can I I want to regain the floor here just for a second there are questions that the citizens have asked us to yeah. put forward if I can go back to the transparency and the RFPs. This is kind of a transparency related item. You may segue to that. All right. But we're going to start with Mr. Burkett. This question is to both of you, of course. Each candidate had the opportunity to voluntarily sign a statement of fair campaign practices. Neither of you signed it, according to the person writing this question. Please explain to the community why you chose not to make this important commitment. Well, I, I think that there is, it's very important that you be able to point out all the issues. And rather than get into trouble because you signed a document that may preclude you from doing certain things when it comes to your opponent, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in making sure that the residents of this town, whether it's this opponent or any opponent, have all the facts, and I don't want some interpretation later on coming back and saying, well, you really shouldn't have said that about your opponent because you violated the document that you signed, and now you've got a new set of problems. That's the problem with that document for me. Mr. Danzinger, your explanation is not. All right, so I'm going to take it back quickly just to the RFP process because my opponent couldn't recall anything, but in actuality, their commission waived the RFP for Paul Abbott, who was the engineer initially for the undergrounding project, one of the biggest projects that our town is going to undertake in history, um, who ended up quitting on us because he didn't know what he was doing. Um, mm -hmm. But regarding the form, uh, the, the, um, the, the waiver. Fair campaign Practices Act. Yeah, so I think it's kind of obvious why my opponent refused to sign it. Um, this is really about a community, the divisiveness, <laughs> the, the tension that we have in this community. Um, when I was first elected, I spoke about bringing this community together. You know, what I wanted to do was, was, what I wanted to do was bring back the, what we saw, right? I wanted, I knew we can achieve this. I saw it after the Champlain Towers. I saw the community come out together regardless of the denomination or the color, and that's what I wanted to bring back. We created more senior programs here. I spoke about the different uh, programs that we've started. We've tripled the number of community events here, and they became a priority because they continue to bring out families and community together. We brought kosher food to our events because now they became all-inclusive. This is the first time in Surfside history where you can walk out and see an Orthodox man dancing with his child to salsa at one of our music events. For the first time in Surfside history, a mayor has received bipartisan support from our state and local officials gay, straight, black, white, and Hispanic, or others, those who have all been working with me and understand what I've been bringing to this city. And lastly, I'd go so far as to say that I'm not only, that I've been accused of being divisive, and that's what this is, right? But I think I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not only not divisive, but I am the mayor who brought everybody together. There is nobody, there is nobody in the history of Surfside, there was nobody in the history of Surfside who was able to get Mr. Burkett Eliana Salzauer, Tina Paul, all on the same page working together. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Danziger. Mr. Mr. Dan Danziger, please, to satisfy the question from the citizen, your explanation as to why not sign. I've been asked the same question last time I ran, and I'll respond the same way. There are thousands of people who died to get to protect our Constitution, and I believe that signing away your First Amendment right is against and, and desecrates what they died for. The same answer I gave the last election and the one before that. I okay, well, I, I'm going to reserve the right to conclude relatively soon. As totally but this next question, and this will start with Mr. Danzi. Let me just say this, uh, Doctor. I, I, I don't want you to have to conclude. I, hope, I would ask everybody to please listen. I think it's more important that we hear what the candidates have to say, and I, I don't want to lose the good doctor and have him, out of frustration, call this thing early because I think there's a lot of important information that our residents need to hear. I'm sorry, Doctor. Go ahead. 
Well, let's let's start with Mr. Danziger. This this question came in this evening. It says, "What might be steps to take as mayor to heal the growing schism between pro-development and expansion, and those who desire to maintain a small town charm and minimize growth? What might what steps might you take to heal this growing schism between?" Those in favor of development and those looking to maintain the small size, small town flavor. So I think that's the balance that we've been trying to work towards for years. Um, and I says, as I said before, we've never changed the size of the helms. We've never approved any projects that weren't allowed to code before us. We've never enhanced or, or enlarged any of the, what's allowed. Um, one of the things people don't understand is nobody wants bigger homes. My home is along Harding Avenue. If I were to have a 24-foot building, I would be living in the shadows just like anyone else at Sunny Isles. So I think we're all on the same page with that, and that's really what my opponent likes to go around. They scream about Surfside turning into Sunny Isles. They've been using this uh, ploy every election. There is nobody in this town that wants that. And here's a secret. Not even the developers want that. If you think that the Four Seasons wants a 12-story building across the street from them blocking their residents' view of the bay, you're sadly mistaken. So not our, re not our developer partners and none of the residents want this, and that's something we'll continue to uh, protect here in Surfside. Okay. Uh, Mr. Burkett, yeah, the, the, you know, it, it, you know uh, Mr. Danzinger continues to say that the, the size of the homes hasn't changed, but, you know, all the goodies that go along with it, the terraces, the driveways, the balconies, the overhangs, all those things have changed. And Setbacks what, haven't changed. Okay, I didn't interrupt you, Mr. Danzinger. Actually, you have multiple times. Let's please, neither of you, interrupt each other. I'm just trying to get the facts out, that's all. Well, please. I mean, really. I mean, this is, decorum is, you know, this, this debate format you have your opportunity to respond to the questions and respond then. And let's not interrupt each other. Thank Mr. you. Burkett, Thank you. Um, you know, anybody with two eyes can go around and see that what he's saying is not true. The houses that are being built now cover almost the entire lot. They're giant boxes. Okay. And it's, you know, the design review guidelines that we have are not being employed, okay? The Planning and Zoning Board has dropped its responsibility to make sure that these homes are beautiful and interesting and different. Instead, we've got homes that all look the same. Looks like they came out of a cookie cutter. Looks like they're using the same architect and they make a balcony a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller, just to save money on architectural fees because we keep putting up the same type of house. But you know, that in the Four Seasons, of course, yeah, the Four Seasons is, you know, again, a half truth. The Four Seasons doesn't want to see bad development. They're, they're one of the good developers. But that doesn't mean that all these other projects that are coming up online are Four season developers, because they're not. They're developers that are looking to maximize their profit. Our job as the adults in the room, as the people that care for this city, and are responsible for what happens in the city is to stop these people from doing things that are going to exploit what we have instead of complement it. We're supposed to be up here pushing back, not saying yes to everything that is asked for. And that's not what's going to happen when I'm the mayor. Okay, this question begins with you, Mr. Burkett. I can go back to the homes for a second because there's some information that got put in there that's inaccurate. I, it's it's kind of a... That is probably the biggest issue here in Surfside, so I'd love to get back on that. So first of all, I'm going to say hi to Mayor Svetchen from Sunny Isles or all the other people from North Bay Village and everybody that's watching. There's actually a watch party in Tallahassee, so um, it's pretty interesting. Everybody wave. Um, but the home sizes, right? So again, they haven't changed. The setbacks remain the same. Why are we seeing bigger houses now, right? And first of all, I'm going to say that the houses being built right now were all approved under the last administration. That's just a fact. Um, but why are we seeing bigger houses now? Ten years ago, our property was maybe worth $80,000 for the property. You couldn't build a $2 million on $80,000 property. Now our properties alone are worth almost $2 million. The smallest little lot is worth $1.7. It becomes more viable and more um, financially viable to go ahead and build a $2 million home on a $2 million property. And that's what it is. It's just economics. It's not about who's moving in here and what. 
It just became worthwhile. The financial market dictates it, and suddenly it's become viable to build a $2 million home on a $2 million lot. Okay, but yeah, that's, not, that's all very nice. But everybody sees what's going on. Everybody understands what's going on. Everyone's seen the aerial pictures. Everyone's seen the houses on Bay Drive that are 10 feet away from the seawall or 12 feet or 15 feet. And they've seen them covering almost the entire lot. They've seen the houses that are so close together, you could almost reach out and touch the next house. So, you know, there's work that needs to be done. And if this keeps going, we're going to end up looking like a series of row houses. And again, you can go to my website and you can see that. You can see what that would look like. And that's just not what I want. And you know what? It's a decision we get to make as a community. Just because this mayor and his development pals and Rose who builds the houses, okay, wants to do it because they make money doing it, doesn't mean that we have to do it, okay? We get to decide. We get to decide what our community looks like. We get to decide what we want to see in our community, okay? We don't have to do anything. As a group, we come together and we put our ideas together and we decide what our community is going to look like. That's what's important. Well, let me follow up and I'll ask both of you then. Are there proposed code changes you would do to your land use code to prevent development that's occurring under the current existing code? Is that to me or to him? To you. Oh, to me. Well, listen, I think that one of the things, the first thing we have to do is get our design guidelines intact, and we got to get rid of the planning board, okay? The planning board right now is just a rubber stamp for this commission. This commission is all developer-oriented. The planning board is their, it's their team. They, they, they meet together secretly even. They, they make plans. We have pictures of these guys at the Four Seasons before a billion dollar vote. I mean, whether they were talking about the vote or not, it just shows terrible judgment. Terrible. You don't do that. You have a responsibility and a duty as elected officials to look out for the best interest. You have a duty to come to these meetings and talk about what you're going to do for our town in front of the audience, in front of the residents. Your duty does not include going for drinks and hugs at the Four Seasons and making deals behind closed doors. That just doesn't happen. So the answer to your question is, is the design guidelines, the new planning board, responsible adults, professionals who understand what it would take to make the town look beautiful and great, that's the first step. Mr. Danzinger. The, so, the, the assertion that you know development is occurring currently under the existing code without any modifications, do you have proposals or plans to modify or change the code to alter the state of development here in this town? Or, and, and if you want to reference those design guidelines, if that needs to be refreshed or renewed? I mean, what's so the design guidelines is something he talks about, something we've, but it's actually something we've implemented. So first of all, having drinks with my coworkers and other board members is actually something, I'm sorry that the former mayor couldn't experience that with his own team. They were too busy flipping each other off at meetings to actually sit down and be friends after that uh, conversation. Um, but my, my question for, for the man over here is, you know, he's, he's railing up against these homes that are being built. And my question is, you actually approve them. 17 of the Rose homes that are going up now were approved under your administration. So you sit and you talk about how you hate these homes and you hate them, but you're the one who approved it. Um, there is something, is and we spoke about it. Excuse me, I'm still talking. So we spoke about this at the last meeting, and that's called the Bird Harris Act. And I know we had our town attorney speak about it, and it's on record multiple times. You cannot downzone and take away the value of someone's property. The homeowners can sue the town. It's not for us to go ahead, and I know uh, my opponent over here during his last administration thought he was going to reduce the size of the homes. You can't do that, all right? That's plain and simple. I'm going to protect the homeowner's rights. Again, the size of the homes have been allowed for the last 20 years. Before that, they were even bigger. It's been that way forever. That's what we're going to protect. We're not going to come here and threaten homeowners that they're too big or too small. It's not for us to decide how big somebody thinks that their home needs to be. If they have five kids, two kids, or seven kids, that's their business and they'll be allowed to build what's always been allowed by right. Okay. All right. There's no ban on technology. Do I get to uh, yes, respond Mr. to that? Yes, Mr. Burkett, if okay. you'd like to respond. Yeah. On no. this issue, you mentioned the design guidelines and code you know, if I'm, there's potential changes being planned. No. You know, the Burt Harris Act, lawsuits, um, you know, Mr. Mr. Danzing. He's processing, give me a um, second. 
make statements as though the statements are true. Okay. They are. Just because yeah. they are. Okay. He's 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 asserted that they are. So they Our must Our attorney be has asserted that actually. Okay. But the problem with his statement about you know, and again, no one has said uh tonight that that is what we're talking about. What we're talking about are the design guidelines and he said that if you decide to change the zoning, you're going to get sued. So presumably it's a one-way ticket, meaning if you allow more and more and more, you don't get sued. But if you say that you want to do something that's a little more restricted, you do get sued. It's, it's, it's foolish on its face. And if it were true, that would mean that there would be no zoning laws in any city. Okay, It would mean that no city can make its own rules. So it's not true. It's just foolish. And what it is, it is an argument for developers and an effort to frighten people away from taking charge of their town and taking charge of their destiny and making their neighborhoods look like they want to look like rather than the way developers want them to look like. Okay, very good. I think so we've good. exhausted that question. Yeah. Well, I would just want to touch on lawsuits because my, my opponent has no problem spending town money when it comes to lawsuits. We got into office and we were engaged in multiple lawsuits for different items that they had no business getting involved in. He spent, you know, we were going to talk about expenditures and town money. You spend $250,000 on, and I'm going to say the Burkett zoning code because it's all about branding apparently. That went nowhere. He spent over $200,000 on a personal fight with the FAA to try to redirect the flights from Miami. I mean, that's a little bit of an apple to bite off of. His own personal name was listed in this lawsuit. So if there was a monetary compensation, he would have gotten paid out from our dollars. Um, this is, I mean, this is basically criminal and really should be investigated. Okay, good one. Okay, so what was the first one? That, oh, the first one was the zoning code. I'll so write it down that, for you if you need. Yeah, yeah, no, I got it. Okay. The first one was the zoning code. I spent, I spent, I spent $200,000. No, he's- two hundred and fifty. He's mistaken. No. Our commission spent. Okay. No, I don't do, I'm not a strong mayor. He's the strong mayor. Okay. So I'm also the better looking mayor, just by the way. I just, I'll add that in there. Yeah. Um, just... This is what we're up against. But anyway, so let's go through that. So th he, wants, he wants residents to believe that. I spent $200,000 for myself on a zoning code, okay? The reality is, is we spent two years working to put together a code. My entire commission spent that time, spent that money trying to do that. So that's, that's a really serious misrepresentation of what happened. Let's go to the second one where he says I was going to benefit and it might be criminal, okay? The FAA, Miami Beach was very clever several years ago. All the airplanes used to fly straight out over the Julia Tuttle Causeway, go out to the ocean, and go wherever they were going to go. So what happened was Miami Beach got smart. They hired a lobbyist, Kimley Horn. They lobbied the FAA, and they got the FAA to change the routes. And do you know where the routes go now? They go south of Miami Beach over Virginia Key, and they go north of Miami Beach right over North Bay Village, Surfside, Indian Creek, Bay Harbor, Bal Harbor, and North Miami. So all day long, all night long, we have jets two minutes apart flying out over Miami International. So what happened was Charles Burkett didn't do that. They needed a name of a resident because Bay Harbor joined that suit, Indian Creek joined that suit, Bay Harbor joined that suit, North Miami Beach joined that suit, and everybody filed an appeal with the FAA to get them to unwind that. So the fact, the fact that this gentleman would sit here tonight and try to have you believe that I spent 200000 on zoning that benefited me, and I put my name on a lawsuit that was joined by six or seven other cities, including North Bay Village, and that might have been criminal, just goes to show you what he's all about, okay? All right, so I just want to respond to that if I can. It is the mayor that leads the initiatives, right? But as he said, it's the commission that approves it. It wasn't called the Surfside Commission Zoning Code Rewrite. It was called the Burkett Zoning Code Rewrite. 
Um, that's a fact. Now, none of the other municipalities with the FAA actually had anybody that was on there. There was no other single individuals listed except for this person who continued this fight after office. I did try to help him out to a certain extent, but at some point it became futile when we were the only people left in this fight. Every other village dropped out of it because you can't fight City Hall and you definitely can't fight the federal government. Well, actually... And I do want to just correct myself. It was $168,620 of taxpayer money that you went and fought the FAA with. A, a, an issue that no other resident in town seemed to have, by the way. A, 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 an issue that a lot of residents were concerned about and still are. I have are. not heard anything about this. I've been in office okay, two but years. But now I'm going to respond, so you get to listen, okay? So the, the, the fact of the matter is, is that this was a, a huge issue, but that's not the point. The point now is that what he's trying to do is conflate issues that affect the town and attach them to me personally, which is really silly. I mean, it's really far-fetched and really disingenuous. So I, I think that everybody ought to take note of, of that type of behavior. Okay, we're going to start this next question on a, on a whole different topic. Can't wait. Uh, for Mr. Danziger, if elected, would you when, consider when? two Visualize. shorter commission meetings per month beginning at 7 p.m. instead of one very long meeting. So I've actually had a conversation similar to this to the mayor of Sunny Isles. Again, and shout out hi because they're watching. Um, and what they do is they've divided their meetings into three parts, essentially. Um, you have their, their public input meeting, and then you have the resolution meetings, and they have discussion meetings. I've had conversations with some of our residents. It didn't seem to be something they want. Um, if you've been to a meeting, and there's been maybe five people here that have, and that's just the point. There is no resident participation. You've got, and I don't want to say their names, but you've got the same three people that show up to every meeting and talk on every item. I've created, um, I've created virtual meetings. Our public, in, our public participation, I mean, is pretty high, and it's getting higher in some of the items. But we're still in the double digits when we have 6,000 residents. We're doing what we can to increase part uh, participation. That includes um, webinars, Q&A that is done at certain hours that are better beneficial to the people at home. They can uh, dial in on their own convenience from their couch. They can participate in the meetings and talk. Um, but uh, we've had done special meetings. If we see that we have larger items, we've split it up and done uh, special meetings for some of the discussion so we can address some of the other uh, town business on our regular meeting. Very good. Mr. Burkett. Yeah. Boy, that was a long answer. Um, I think the the answer is yeah. We're, I'm I'm open to efficient ideas, uh, ideas that make the meetings go faster, smoother, and are more effective. As long as our residents are able to attend, uh, even if they don't, you want to make those meetings so that it's possible for them to attend. So yeah, those are all good ideas. They're, they're ideas, but again, I'm going to remind everybody that your meeting went to triple C's by the time we were done because nothing got done. When it all right, comes so efficiency. I'm sorry, I didn't. I didn't step over you. No, no. I mean, um, I guess when it comes to efficiency, free, it's, it's nice to talk, but uh, action speak. And again, we are the commission that has gotten through every single agenda, every single meeting. Okay. Um, Big deal. This next, this next question. <laughs> you guys have been going back and forth so much. Uh, we'll begin with Mr. Burkett says, regardless of whoever wins, the town is currently divided. How will you restore trust and bring our residents together? I, you know, again, I, I think that the town is not divided. I think that we had a, uh, I think we have a divisive mayor. I think, uh, you know, tossing around, you know, if you disagree with him, he calls you an anti-Semite. But, you know, that is... Uh, Aside from that, aside from his divisiveness and his obvious conceit and all the other things that you've seen tonight, um, yes, he's the best looking guy at the dais, okay? Wonderful. That's wonderful. But the point is, is that uh, we don't have division as much as we have um, different opinions on different issues. And that's where we have our divide. So um, I'm okay with that. I mean, that's what this whole process is about. Um, I stand up and I say what I'm willing to do and what I stand for. He says what he's willing to do and what he stands for, and then people vote. That's the way I see it. So um, do we want to make sure that we reach out to everybody 
That's my job. My duty is to reach out to everybody and not make some people feel bad because they're not like me. Okay? I reach out to everybody. We never had this problem before. We never had division before like we do right now. Okay? Because he's fostered it. But we won't have that after March. Mr. Danziger. Regardless of who wins, the town is currently divided, according to the individual submitting the question. How will you restore trust and bring our residents together? So again, I don't think our town is divided. I'm out there at every event, and I see people smiling. I see people getting along of all denominations and color, and that's the town that I see. What we have is a few individuals that like to create this division. I mean, all you have to do is read one of his emails. He says he loves everybody, but yet he's talking about closing kosher restaurants and we have enough people moving here. That's not my words. Those are his. Um, this man has been walking the streets over the last two months, warning people of an orthodox takeover. That, again, this is coming from a single person. Um, what I see, again, is a town united, people with a shared goal and a shared vision. We've been moving forward on these things, again, increasing events here in town, increasing family participations, community events, getting people out, getting people together, and that's what it's all about. Okay, that's nice. Um, the, uh, he won't be able to show you where I ever said that I was going to close a kosher restaurant or I ever wrote that I was going to close a kosher restaurant. But this is an example, what you just heard, those two comments, and the other one was something I was going around, what, telling people, what, what was the other one, that I was saying bad things about a certain religion? Um, that stuff, that kind of toxic, hateful stuff, that's the thing that people who are losing resort to. And that's what it's come to with this gentleman, because you won't see that. You know. What he should have said was that I said that I would like to see, okay, restaurants that are open on the weekends. That's all I said. I said that I'd like to see, you know, the downtown have restaurants open more than half the weekend. That's all I said. Okay. And that got converted into, I hate Jewish people. So but that, that's a convenient narrative that he's using and fostering because he's frightening part of our community. You know, I stood up with our Orthodox community when those buildings fell down. I worked with the rescue guys from Israel. We carried the flag together, the Israeli flag together. We prayed together. We worked together. But that doesn't mean anything because. We're here trying to win an election, and we're going to use religion, and we're going to use any tool we can to win. And that's really despicable. It's really bad, okay? Now, you know, when you conflate, you know, a real anti-Semite, someone that wishes bad things on Jewish people, somebody that wishes death on Jewish people— somebody that is a real bigot and a nasty person, and you conflate that with someone who disagrees with you on a subject that has to do with zoning, you got a problem. And that's what's going on here, you see? And that's what we're going to have to deal with here because that's the rhetoric that's coming from the other side. And that's unfortunate. And I wish it wasn't. So if I, first of all, I just want to you know, let everybody know I have a few black friends. Seems to be very important here. Um, this is we're the commission. Um, we're the mayor that has drinks with our fellow friends. We, if you come out and you see us interacting with the residents, that's what it's about. Come to an event. Um, I'm not the mayor that had my, uh, the finger flipped off at me by my fellow commissioners. So for him to sit up here and talk about unity and just want to remind people what they went through over the last two years before we got in. Well, the question was, what you do to bring people together? Yeah. <laughs> so we're already doing it. And as soon as the noise goes away, you'll be able to see that. Um, I want to I challenge every resident right here to go ahead and go to, you know, they, again, it comes down to this uh, ploy that I'm so divisive. Go on to the Miami Herald, Google my name, 
and you'll see that there's one person that writes all this, uh, all these articles, all these hit pieces. I'm going to call them. Go to the Miami New Times. It's the same person every single time. There is no divisiveness here. There's one or two people here that create this narrative because they've done this through the last three administrations, and they'll continue doing it until we finally beat them and win them, and then they'll go away for a while, and we'll be able to continue to uh, carry on as a good normal town. Well, see I that get- that uh, doctor, that is the mindset here. They'll go away for a while, you see, and 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 that's the mindset. There's not the we will work with them mindset. You see, there's the they, we're going to make them go away, and that's the same theme that permeates through his meetings. He wants to make the speakers that don't agree with him go away, and that's where the problem lies. You don't make people that you disagree with go away. You talk to them. You figure out what they're having to say, and you try to reach compromise. You try to com- find common ground. But that's not the theme here. His thing is to make them go away. And he just said it, and I think that was very, very important. The, the next, I, I want to move on to something, because there was a number of questions relative to the planning board that, that were weaved into uh, a lot of these questions. They mentioned the planning board. So I'm going to start with you, Mr. Burkett, and ask you uh, if you have any uh, plans to reform the planning board here in Surfside. Is there is there a need to reform the planning board? And if so, what? I, excuse me. If so, if the if there's a need to reform it, in what way would you uh, modify the planning board and its duties here in Surfside? Well. Well, there absolutely is. The planning board is an extension of the three gentlemen that sit up here. That's the group. They're all friends. He's, he said it tonight. He said, we're all friends. We go out drinking together. We go to a meeting. We talk about a billion-dollar project, and then we go out drinking together. We're all pals. You know, we talk about stuff, okay? This is not a social club. We're here to do a job for our residents. We're not here to make friends, Okay, we're here to do a job. We have a duty. We have a responsibility. We need to be serious about all these things that come in front of us. It's not the kind of thing where you go out and you have a few beers and you talk about the issue and you agree what you're going to do. So the meetings go really quickly. Once everybody knows what they're going to vote on and how they're going to vote, all you have to do is show up to the meetings, announce the issue, vote yes or no, and move on to the next one. Yeah, it goes fast. But when you don't know what is going to be said and you don't know how your your other colleagues on the day is feel, that takes longer because that requires a conversation. That requires a debate. That requires hashing things out and listening to what people have to say when they come up and they speak. You know, people speaking in front of this commission are, not, are, are nuisances. That's why he sends them away because he already knows what he wants to do. He's already heard it. He did that with the families. You know, this gentleman took a piece of letterhead, Surfside letterhead, put a date on it, addressed it to whom it may concern, and said, you can go F off. And then he signed it, and he left it on the dais for one of our commissioners. That's the kind of guy we're dealing with here. A guy that would take stationery, write an FU letter, sign it on town, town stationery, and leave it for a colleague. Okay, I, I want to focus. I, I mean, no, no, but we're... Board. The planning board has to go away. The planning, well, the planning board, the planning board as it's constructed right now, has to go away and be completely reappointed. We need to appoint new people that aren't conflicted. You know, we've got a chairwoman of the planning board. She she's the most prolific house flipper in in this town. So other than changing the personnel, I'm just saying what what you've got here is you've got you've got the regulator and the regulatee all in one person. You've got both sides of the equation. So they've got it all tied up. They've, they run the planning board. If somebody needs something from the planning board, they're wired in. They've got it all locked in. It all happens. It's not in the best interest of the town. It's what's in the best interest of the members of the planning board or their friends. They're all friends here. This is what's going on. It's a cabal that they have their friends and they make things happen for themselves. So you're... So the answer, the answer to the question, you know, you've got, you got, I'm hurting some feelings over here, and I'm sorry about it, but the, the fact of the matter is they've had their two years, they've done what they're going to do, and now it's time for a change, and we're going to get that change. Okay, Mr. Danzinger, on the, on, the, on the matter of the planning board, I mean, there, there are concerns expressed by the residents in these, in these questions about the planning board. 
I'm curious if you have any intention to modify or reform the planning board going forward, or if you think there's no problem, or uh, if there's something that needs to be changed in how the members are appointed. If you would elaborate on the planning board, just for the... So I guess we'll give a bit of a background on a planning board. Um, similar to any other board, every person on the commission um, appoints one person. I don't have the ability to change the entire planning board. That's not within any of our capabilities. We appoint someone that has the same visions and objectives as you, and you put them on the, on the board, because that's what you want them to do is carry on that vision. Um, the Planning and Zoning Board's purpose is to review projects, commercial, both commercial and residential, and ensure that it conforms to certain requirements. It's the town planner's job to come before the town, uh, before the board, and explain if the project conforms, and they go through a list of those items. And that's what they base their decisions on. It's not based on personal preference of a project, if the wall is blue or green, unless that's in the design comp. It's about does it conform to the town code, and that's it. We are lucky we have a lot of good, uh, the last administration put on a bunch of activists onto this thing that knew nothing about development, construction, architecture, or anything. We have good people. We have architects, we have attorneys, we have people in real estate that understand, and I think we have a good board going on there, and I appreciate and thank them for their service. Okay, all right. Having them, you know, drag through emails and be, and be disgraced by this person is, is, was disgusting. These are just residents that are trying to serve their community, and they deserve I know. Of. They're, they're, they're just nice people doing a nice job. But, you know, you are, the funny they are thing your is, residents. you're interrupting me now. It's my turn. Okay. Uh, you know, disgraced. You know, it, 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 it's funny that the, the Mr. Danzinger makes uh, a lot of statements, but there's not an iota of proof behind them. So all he needs to do is identify the way that I disgraced anybody, which I didn't. All I did was recite the facts, and the problem is, is that upsets them. Okay. Maybe I should open that email where you go after each of the board members individually. Again, this is the man who's going to bring our please, community together, right? Please open it and read it. If you give me the time, I'll open up everything. Yeah, I, I'd love that. Please do. Actually, I won't reverberate your <laughs> We had Mr. Forbes who got up and spoke against you at a meeting. We had Mrs. Please. The, the chair. Please. You have consistently gone after members of the board, which is unprecedented in the town Listen, you're, side you're for a former on, mayor and elected official to go after residents right now, and it says who serve on boards. It says your time is up. Okay. Sorry. Now, Sorry. When we did our opening statements tonight, I had uh, Mr. Burkett open for our closing statements. I'm going to ask Mr. Danzig. Oh, come on. That's it? Yes. I mean, I, 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 the questions, the themes of all these questions are <laughs> the rest this evening. All right. Uh, so I think we're ready for our closing statements. All right. Candidates for mayor here in service. Mr. Danziger, you have three minutes. And no interruptions. Yeah, it would be nice if I didn't get interruptions. From the audience or anyone. All right. Albert Einstein once said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. My opponent thinks that we here in Surfside are insane. He has been a failed mayor three times and has lost his race five times over the last 15 years. He keeps reinventing himself, but a leopard can't change its spots. His true self keeps coming out, and we keep voting him out time in and time again. It's time that our town moves forward. We cannot keep reverting back to the same old failures and expect it will be different this time. Both myself and my opponent have a track record this time, and our work speaks for itself. On one hand, we have my opponent, whose lies are overshadowed by his big accomplishment in his last term, locking six-foot hedges in the charter. On the other hand, I can turn to the record numbers of projects and initiatives we have accomplished during such a short time. I'm not campaigning on promises of funding and approving. I'm campaigning on tangible products and on projects and getting things done. We've focused on the community and pedestrian safety, health and outdoors, family and community events, investing in our youth, our town infrastructure, and our future. These are not just catchphrases. These initiatives can be quantified by the many projects that we have done throughout our town. You can't argue with results, and we have delivered results. And I know we love visuals. So here's Mr. Burkett's accomplishment, locking six-foot hedges in the charter. And this is every single item that we have done over the last two years. This is available on my town website, shlomoforsurfside.com, if you'd like to read it. My opponent would like you to believe that my term has been so divisive. 
But look who's saying that. It's the same 10 people who have been crying wolf throughout the last three administrations. My opponent is trying to make this election about Jews versus non-Jews, Orthodox versus Reform. He is creating division because, as Sun Tzu teaches, divide and conquer. But I don't see a divided surf side. I look around at a community and I see smiles. I see the community united. I see people with a shared sense of family and prosperity. If my opponent ever came out to some of these items, he might have, some of these events, he probably would have seen that too. What separates me from my opponent is I've always been simple and transparent. My opponent has never campaigned on objectives or positive change. His platform has always been one of divisiveness and accusations and corruption. He does not have a vision for Surfside's future, but rather pretends he wants to preserve an idea of Surfside's distant past. Unlike my opponent, I am invested in this community. My wife and I are raising our kids here. They go to the same schools here as your kids. My opponent owns multiple properties in Miami and across the USA. I only have one home, and my home is here in Surfside. My future is here in Surfside. I'm running for office because I want to continue investing in our future. I want to make our town a better place for my family and yours. My opponent wants to take us backwards to a time before our streets were filled with the cheerful delights of children playing. Take away all the noise and the hate that my opponent has created and what you are left with are results. You'll see enhancement to safety, community activities, and capital improvement projects. Vote for me and the commissioners who share this same vision. This election, I'll continue to deliver on my promises, and I'll continue to get things done for our town. Mr. Burkett, for a three-minute closing statement, please, no interruptions. Dr. Murphy, thank you for putting up with us tonight. I know it's been challenging. I want to thank everyone else for giving up your valuable time to come and listen tonight. I appreciate it. So. What would electing Charles Burkett mean for Surfside voters? It would mean me working with my colleagues on the following. All voices at meetings would be given the opportunity to share their opinions without fear of being embarrassed or removed. A return to ethical, honest stewardship of our town. Town projects and initiatives would bubble up from our town boards and residents, not from the decrees of politics. Crazy water bills would be lowered. We take immediate and massive steps to crush speeders and cut through traffic like I did the last time I was mayor. Honor promises and finish the 96th Street Park, Abbott flooding, and FPL undergrounding projects. Focus on enhancing kids and seniors programs. Transform the police force, putting all our police out on the streets so that police are seen and calls for help are answered rapidly. Review and correct recent self-serving zoning code changes. Figure out a way to protect our vulnerable condo owners from hungry developers trying to take their homes away from them. Undertake a review of our charter that adds protections against unscrupulous future politicians and their tendencies to sell out residents. Appoint qualified non-conflicted residents to our boards and committees. Encourage a new planning and zoning board to institute better design guidelines that will protect our town from identical, cookie cutter, square box style homes. Finish the safe walking paths in our residential districts so our kids and residents walking to worship, shop, or swim are safe. Work with the good developers, the ones who care about Surfside's future, not the ones who only care about quick profit that they can put in their pockets. Get that memorial to the 98 who died finished by re-involving the abandoned families in the process. Ensure that residents experience smiling, helpful, efficient town staff at Town Hall. Of course, keep taxes low, keep our beach uncommercialized, and keep the Live Local Act, the one that could bring a wall of 12-story affordable housing projects to Harding and Collins, out of our town. Slash or even eliminate permit fees for residents upgrading their homes or buildings that are taking steps to make them safer. Rework code enforcement process so it treats everyone the same and encourages compliance in a friendly, non-threatening manner. Take any and all steps to ensure our small town way of life is not threatened. Protect our town, which is the goose who continues to lay the golden eggs, while at the same time improving, upgrading, and enhancing our infrastructure, our building, and our housing stock. Thank you for listening. Let's give both our candidates a round of applause. I, 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 
On behalf of the League of Women Voters, I want to thank you all for coming this evening. And it's a, uh, it's a reminder that everybody needs to cast their ballots. Everybody needs to register to vote and get ready to vote in this election and all upcoming elections. Hey, Doc. Oh, and outside, if you need voter registration. Thank you. The League of Women Voters is here to help you with voter registration. Thank you. Thank you so much.